Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be covering chapter 4 for our MCAT Behavioral Science playlist. This chapter is titled Cognition, Consciousness, and Language. And in this chapter, we're going to cover the following objectives. The first objective is titled Cognition. Here we're going to define cognition. We're going to talk about information processing model and cognitive development. In addition, we'll cover different things that affect cognitive development like genetics, environment, biological factors. Then we'll move into the second objective, which is titled problem solving and decision making. Here we're going to cover different types of problem solving techniques. We'll also talk about how heuristics, biases, intuition, and emotion play a role in decision making. And then we'll also cover intellectual functioning. Then our third objective is titled consciousness. We're going to cover the stages of consciousness. We'll focus on alertness, sleep, hypnosis, and meditation. Then we'll move into the fourth objective, which is all about consciousness altering drugs. There's four different categories that we will discuss. That's depressants, stimulants, opioids, and hallucinogens. What we're going to also find out is that marijuana falls under multiple categories and we'll discuss it on its own before finally un beginning to understand what leads to drug addiction and the consequences of drug addiction. The fifth objective is about attention. Here we're really just going to compare and contrast selective versus divided attention. And then last but not least, our final objective is on language. We're going to learn the components of language. We will understand language development and cognition. And we will also refamiliarize ourselves with the brain areas that play a role in language development and comprehension. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with this first objective titled cognition. Now, the study of cognition looks at how our brains process and react to the incredible information overload presented to us by the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, cognition overall is not a uniquely human trait, but we are certainly the most advanced species on the planet in terms of complex thought. And the first thing that we want to talk about now that we understand cognition is information processing model. In the 1950s, much of science and engineering turned towards the production of computers and artificial intelligence. And it was noted that certain steps were required in order to use a computer to store and process information. Those things are first, well, the information must be encoded in a language that the computer understands. Then that information must be stored in such a way that it can be found later. And finally, the computer must be able to retrieve the information when it is required. Now, early on, psychologists took this model of information processing and tried to apply it to the human brain. They theorized that the brain is somewhat like a computer. It must encode information into a series of chemical and electrical signals, and then the brain must be able to store this information so it can be retrieved when needed. And then when there is a need to retrieve the information, there's a process by which the brain can follow to be able to retrieve said information. The thing is, though, is that the human brain is not a computer. And while this analogy creates a simple paradigm by which information is processed by the brain, it really doesn't tell the whole story because the human brain doesn't just handle information in the form of facts. It also handles emotion, sensations, as well as memories. And so the information processing model is a framework that's used by cognitive psychologists to explain and describe the processes of the human brain. And it has four key components that we want to cover. First component is that thinking requires sensation, encoding, and storage of stimuli. And we've covered this in previous chapters so far. The second thing is that stimuli must be analyzed by the brain rather than responded to automatically to be useful in decision making. Third, decisions made in one situation can be extrapolated and adjusted to help solve 
new problems. And then last, but certainly not least, problem solving is dependent not only on the person's cognitive level, but also on the context and complexity of the problem. With that, we want to turn our attention now to cognitive development. Cognitive development is the development of one's ability to think and solve problems across their lifespan. And here in this topic, we're going to focus on Piaget's stages of cognitive development. Now, Piaget was one of the most influential figures in developmental psychology. He insisted that there are qualitative differences between the way that children and adults think. And so he divided the lifespan into four stages of cognitive development. Those stages are sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. And Piaget believed believe that passage through each of these stages was continuous and sequential in which the completion of each stage prepared the individual for the next stage that followed. Now, before we delve into the actual stages, we have to look at how Piaget explained learning. According to him, infants learn mainly through instinctual interaction with the environment. So for example, infants possess a grasping reflex. And through experience with this reflex, the infants learn that it's possible to grasp objects. And Piaget referred to these organized patterns of behavior and thought as schematas. And a, a, a schema can include a concept like what is a dog, a behavior, what do you do when someone asks you your name, or a sequence of events. What do you normally do in a sit-down restaurant. And as a child proceeds through the stages, new information has to be placed into different schematas. And he theorized that new information is going to be processed via adaptation. All right, so via adaptation. According to him, adaptation to information comes by two complementary processes. These are assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation is the process of classifying new information into existing schematas. If the new information doesn't fit neatly into something that already exists, then accommodation occurs. And accommodation is the process by which existing schematas are modified to encompass this new information. With this background, what we can do now is talk about the four stages of cognitive development. The first stage is the sensory motor stage, starting at birth and lasting until about two years of age. In this stage, a child learns to manipulate his or her environment in order to meet physical needs. And there's two different types of circular reactions that occur in this stage. First, there's primary circular reactions. These are the repetition of a body movement that originally occurred by chance, like when a child sucks um, their thumb. Usually that behavior is repeated because the child finds it soothing and comforting. There's also secondary circular reactions, which occur when manipulation is focused on something that's outside the body, like repeatedly throwing toys from where they're seated. And these behaviors are repeated because the child gets used to the response from the environment, which is their parent coming by and picking up that drop toy and handing it back to them. Now, the key milestone that ends this stage is the development of object permanence, which is the understanding that objects continue to exist even when they're out of view. This is the idea behind Peekaboo, right? This game is so entertaining to young infants because they lack object permanence. So each time the adult reveals themselves, the child interprets it as though they have just come into existence, you know, and that is so fascinating and stimulating for them. Now, object permanence, it marks the beginning of representational thought in which the children, or the child, I should say, has begun 
to create mental representations of external objects and events. And this leads us into that second stage called the pre-operational stage. It lasts from about two to approximately seven years of age, and it's characterized by three things, symbolic thinking, egocentrism, and centration. Symbolic thinking, this refers to the ability to pretend, play make-believe, and have an imagination. Egocentrism, this refers to the inability to imagine what another person may think or feel. And then centration is the tendency to focus on only one aspect of a phenomena and or the ability to understand the concept of conservation. So a good example for this is if you presented a child with two identical plates of pizza, but one plate is a single large slice and the other plate had, again, the same exact quantity, but presented as two slices, a child in this stage will be unable to tell that the quantities are in fact equal and they will focus mainly on the number of slices on the plate rather than the actual quantity. So with that being said, we move into the third stage. This is called concrete operational stage. It lasts from seven to 11 years of age. In this stage, children can understand now conservation and they can also consider the perspective of others. Additionally, they're able to engage in logical thought as long as they are working with concrete objects or information that is directly available. These children, in this stage, have not yet developed the ability to think abstractly. That happens in the last and final stage, the formal operational stage, which starts around 11 years of age, and it is marked by the ability to think logically about abstract ideas. Generally, coinciding with adolescence, this stage is marked by the ability to reason about abstract concepts and problem solving. And so those are the four stages of cognitive development. And again, in this page, we see that kind of summarized. Our first stage, sensory motor stage, we talked about circular reactions and this, this stage is marked, the end of the stage is marked by object permanence. Stage two, we said that there are three things that really define this, symbolic um, thinking, egocentrism, and centration. Then stage three, children now can understand conservation, and they can also consider the perspective of others. And then the last and final stage, formal operational stage, this is the ability to think logically about abstract ideas. Now, something that's equally important for us to talk about now is the role of culture in cognitive development. Cognitive development is very much related to culture because one's culture will determine what they're expected to learn. Some cultures will place a higher value on social learning, including cultural traditions and roles, while other cultures will value knowledge. Now, in addition, one's culture will also influence the rate of cognitive development because children are treated very differently from one culture to another. Now, Lev Vygotsky is a prominent educational psychologist, and he proposed that the engine driving cognitive development is the child's internalization of their culture, including interpersonal and societal rules, symbols, and language. And as a child develops, their skills and abilities are still in formative stages, but with the help of adults and other children, those skills can develop further. This may come in the form of instruction from a teacher, adult, or another child, or even watching other people perform the skill. But ultimately, the engine driving cognitive development, according to Vygotsky, is the child's internalization of their culture. Now, something else that I want to make mention is that aging brings about many changes in cognition, and cognition can be affected by a wide variety of conditions. This could include actual problems with the brain itself, genetics or chromosomal conditions, metabolic derangements, and even long-term drug use. So there are many things that can affect the way that 
cognitive development occurs or the way that cognition changes about during adult life. With that being said, we can go ahead and move into our second objective, which is taught, titled Problem Solving and Decision Making. Every day you're faced with problems, and many of these problems you solve without any real conscious thought about what is happening. However, much like the scientific method, problem solving itself has a process. First, you frame the problem, either by creating a mental image or a schematic of the issue. Then, you generate potential solutions and begin to test them. These potential solutions, they may be derived from a mental set, which is the tendency to approach similar problems in the same way. And once solutions have been tested, you can evaluate the results and you might even consider other potential solutions that may have been easier or more effective in some way. And that point allows us to discuss a really important thing called functional fixedness. This is the tendency to use objects only in the way they're normally utilized. This can create barriers to problem solving. If you expand your thinking about how to use certain objects in a non-traditional manner, you may find that there is a potential sh solution to your problem that is easier and more effective in some way. With that being said, what we want to talk about next are different types of problem solving. In psychology, there are different approaches to problem solving and they include the following. Trial and error, algorithms, deductive reasoning, and inductive reasoning. And we want to cover what each of these are, starting off with trial and error. This is a less sophisticated type of problem solving in which various solutions are tried until one is found that seems to work. Now, while an educated approach may be used, this type of problem solving is usually only effective when there are relatively few possible solutions. Then we have Algorithms. This is a formula or procedure for solving a certain type of problem. This can be mathematical or it can be a set of instructions that are designed to automatically produce the desired solution. Then we have deductive reasoning, also known as top-down reasoning. Here you're starting from a set of general rules and you draw conclusions from the information given. So an example of deductive reasoning is a logic puzzle. In these puzzles, one has to synthesize a list of logical rules to come up with a single possible solution to the problem. This is in contrast to inductive reasoning, also known as bottom-up reasoning, that seeks to create a theory via generalization. This type of reasoning starts with a specific instance, and then it draws a conclusion from them. So these are our different types of problem solving. And this is a good segue into now next talking about decision making. We make decisions every day. Some are insignificant and some are very important. What are the things that contribute to decision making since it's such a complicated process? Well, we do, we use a number of tools. We use heuristics, biases, intuition, and emotion to speed up or simplify the process of decision making. So all of these things play a role in the decision making process. But what are they exactly? That's what we want to cover up next. Starting off first, with heuristics. These are simplified principles that are used to make decisions. They are also called rule of thumb. There are two kinds of heuristics I want to talk about here, the availability heuristic and the representativeness heuristic. The availability heuristic is used when we try to decide how likely something is. On the other hand, the representativeness heuristic involves categorizing items on the basis of whether they fit the prototypical, stereotypical, or representative image of the category. So, for example, consider a standard coin that's flipped 10 times in a row, and it lands on heads every single time. What is the probability of the coin landing on the 11th time that you flip it? Mathematically, the probability still is 50%, but most individuals will either 
overestimate the probability based on the pattern that has been established, or they underestimate the probability with the logic that the number of heads and tails they have to even out. And so, like the availability heuristic, the use of the representativeness heuristic can sometimes lead us astray. So we have to be careful and cognitive of what we are doing. Now, something else that plays a role is bias and overconfidence. So when a potential solution to a problem fails during testing, this, this solution should be discarded. This is known as disconfirmation principle. The evidence obtained from de uh, testing has demonstrated that that solution does not work. However, the presence of a confirmation bias, it may prevent an individual from actually eliminating this solution. Confirmation bias is the tendency to focus on information that fits an individual's beliefs while rejecting information that goes against them. Confirmation bias also contributes to overconfidence, which is the tendency to incorrectly interpret one's decisions, knowledge, and beliefs as being infallible. Another thing that also falls into this category is belief perseverance, which refers to the inability to reject a particular belief despite there being clear evidence to the contrary. And so together, confirmation bias, overconfidence, and belief perseverance can seriously impede a person's analysis of available evidence. Something else that plays a role is intuition. Intuition can be defined as the ability to act on perceptions that may not be supported by available evidence. In addition to that, there's also emotion. Emotion is the subjective experience of a person in a certain situation. How a person feels often influences how a person thinks and makes decisions. So for example, a person who is very angry is often more likely to engage in some risky decision making. In addition, emotions in decision making are not just limited to the emotion that's experienced while the decision is being made. Emotions that a person expects to feel from a particular decision also plays a role in how you go about making a decision. And all of this is to say that there are different things that contribute and play a role in the way that we make our decisions on a day-to-day -day basis from something that is you know, simple and maybe insignificant, like, like what you're going to wear tomorrow, to making bigger decisions like where are you going to go to grad school or medical school. So these are things to consider. The next and last thing that we want to cover in Objective 2 is intellectual functioning. Intu intellectual functioning is a highly studied area of psychology, and it poses an important question. How is intelligence defined? What makes someone more intelligent than someone else? These are really multifaceted questions that are difficult to answer. However, there are theories that have been proposed and models that have been formed for defining some aspects of intelligence. And the one that we want to really talk about here is multiple intelligences. So there has been a theory formulated by Howard Gardner. It's called Howard Gardner's Theory of Multiple Intelligences. It's one of the most all-encompassing definitions with seven defined types of intelligence. Those are linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, visual, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. Gardner argues, also this is interesting, that Western culture, it values the first two abilities, linguistic and logical, mathematical, over the others. After all, linguistic ability and log logical mathematical ability are the two abilities that are tested on traditional intelligence quotient tests or IQ tests. And so that leads us to talking about IQs. Intelligence is often measured with standardized tests that generate an intelligence quotient or an IQ for the test taker. And generally, that's calculated as mental age over chronological age multiplied by 100. So using this equation, 
A four-year-old with intelligence abilities at the level of an average six-year-old would have an IQ of about 150 using this expression. With that, we have covered everything that we need for objective two, and we're going to move into our third objective titled consciousness. Consciousness is one's level of awareness of both the world and their own existence within that world. The accepted states of consciousness are alertness, sleep, dreaming, and altered states of consciousness. Technically, sleep and dreaming are also considered altered states, but we're going to consider them separately from, say, hypnosis, meditation, and drug-altered states of consciousness, which we'll cover in this objective and then next. So we're going to go ahead and talk about some of these states of consciousness consciousness, starting first and foremost with alertness. Alertness is a state of consciousness in which we are awake and able to think. In this state, we're able to perceive, process, access information, and then express that information verbally. In the, alter, uh, uh, in the alert state, we also experience a certain level of physiological arousal. Here, cortisol levels tend to be higher and electroencephalogram waves indicate a brain that's in the waking state. Alertness is maintained by neurological circuits in the prefrontal cortex at the very front of the brain. And fibers from the prefrontal cortex communicate with the reticular formation. This is a neural structure located in the brainstem to keep the cortex awake and alert. The next thing that we want to talk about then after alertness is sleep. Sleep is a very important topic that is tested on the MCAT, and sleep is studied by recording brainwave activity occurring during the course of a night's sleep. This is actually done with an electroencephalography, or EEG, which records an average of the electrical patterns within different portions of the brain. Now, there are four characteristic EEG patterns correlated with different stages of waking and sleeping. Those are beta, alpha, theta, and delta waves. There is a fifth wave that corresponds to REM sleep, which is the time during the night when we have most of our dreams. These sleep stages, sleep stages they form a complete cycle that lasts about 90 minutes in adults. So let's go ahead and start to talk about these different wave patterns and our the different stages of sleep. Now, beta and alpha waves characterize brain activity when we are awake. So let's look at what beta and alpha waves look like. Beta waves or have a high frequency. They occur when a person is alert or attending to a mental task that requires concentration. Beta waves occur when neurons are randomly firing. Alpha waves, on the other hand, occur when we are awake, but we're relaxing with like our eyes closed. They're somewhat slower than beta waves. In addition, alpha waves are a little more synchronized than beta waves. As soon as you doze off though, right? You are relaxing with your eyes closed, but as soon as you doze off, what happens is you enter stage one of sleep. This is detected on the EEG by the appearance of theta waves. What do theta waves look like? We're gonna scroll down back here. And this is what theta waves look like. At this point, EEG activity is characterized by irregular waveforms with slower frequencies and higher voltages. Okay, so that's stage one. Light sleep, you can be easily woken up. You're in a stage that is ca categorized as non-REM sleep, which we'll define properly here in a second. And theta waves is what's detected on the EEG when you enter stage one. Then as you fall more deeply asleep, you enter stage two. Now the EEG, it shows theta waves, but it also shows theta waves along with sleep spindles and K complexes. Now I don't have an image of that, but I'll flash it on the screen. It's not in the notes, but I'll again flash it on the screen and you can see the characteristic of a sleep spindle and K complex. So those 
along with theta waves, characterize stage two of sleep. Then, when you fall even more deeply asleep, you're going to enter stage three and stage four. These are also known as slow wave sleep stages. So EEG activity grows progressively slower until only a few sleep waves per second are seen. These low frequency, high voltage sleep waves are called delta waves. Let's take a look at what delta waves look like. They're represented right here. During these stages, three and four, it becomes especially difficult to wake someone up from sleep. Slow wave sleep has been associated with cognitive recovery, memory consolidation, as well as increased growth hormone release. Now, stages one through four, one through four, are all part of non-rapid eye movement sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is interspersed between cycles of the non-REM sleep stages. In this stage, arousal levels reach that of wakefulness, but the muscles are paralyzed. It's also called paradoxical sleep because one's heart rate, breathing patterns, and EEG mimics wakefulness, but the individual is still asleep. This is the stage in which dreaming is most likely to occur, and it's also associated with memory consolidation. Recent studies have shown and associated REM more with procedural memory consolidation and then slow wave sleep with more declarative memory consolidation. With that being said, this happens in a cycle. So a sleep cycle refers to a single complete progression through the sleep stages. Over the lifespan, the length of the sleep cycle increases from approximately 50 minutes in children to about 90 minutes in adults. In addition, disruption of slow wave sleep and REM sleep can have negative consequences. It can result in diminished memory. Sleep deprivation also causes diminished cognitive performance. It can also affect move, problem solving, and motor skills. The next thing that we want to ask ourselves then after we've understood the sleep cycle is what regulates our sleep cycle. Our daily cycle of waking and sleeping is regulated by internally gener generated rhythms or circadian rhythms. In humans and other animals, the circadian rhythm approximates a 24-hour cycle that is somewhat affected by external cues such as light. Biochemical signals also underlie circadian rhythms. So sleepiness, for example, can partially be attributed to blood levels of melatonin, which is a serotonin-derived hormone from the penile gland. Another hormone that's important to talk about is cortisol. This is a steroid hormone that's produced in the adrenal cortex, and it's also related to the sleep-wake cycle. Its levels slowly increase during early morning because increasing light causes the release of corticotropin releasing factor from the hypothalamus and this hormone corticotropin releasing factor causes the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary which stimulates cortisol release and cortisol contributes to wakefulness. Now something else that's really interesting to talk about is dreaming. Most dreaming occurs during REM. However, soon after we enter stage two sleep, our mental experiences start to shift to a dreamlike state. Throughout the night, approximately 75% of dreaming occurs during REM. REM dreams, they tend to be longer. They also tend to be a lot more vivid than those experienced during non-REM sleep. Now, while the purpose and meaning of dreams is not fully understood, a few theories have been proposed. We're going to cover a couple of them that might be tested on in the MCAT. The first being activation synthesis theory. Dreams are caused by widespread random activation of neural circuitry. This is what activation synthesis theory proposes. And this activation, it can mimic incoming sensory information. It might also consist of pieces of stored memories, current and previous desires, met and unmet needs, and other experiences. Then there's also 
problem-solving dream theory that says that dreams are a way to solve problems while you are sleeping. And then cognitive process dream theory says that dreams are merely the sleeping counterpart of stream of consciousness. Ultimately, the question is less which of these theories is right and more how can we unify these theories. The study of dreaming is limited by the difference between the brain and the mind. Dreaming must have a neurological component, but it's still clearly highly subjective. Neurocognitive model of dreaming seeks to unify the biological and psychological perspectives on dreaming by correlating the subjective cognitive experience of dreaming with measurable physiological changes. Now, we also need to know about sleep disorders. Sleep disorders are divided into two categories. These two categories are dysomnia and parasomnia. Dysomnias refer to disorders that make it difficult to fall asleep, stay asleep, or avoid sleep. They include things like insomnia, which is difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, and it's one of the most common sleep disorders. It may be related to things like anxiety, depression, medication, or disruption of sleep cycles and circadian rhythms. Narcolepsy also falls under this category. It is a condition that is characterized by lack of voluntary control over the onset of sleep. The symptoms of narcolepsy are unique. They include loss of muscle control and sudden intrusion of REM sleep during waking hours. They're usually caused by emotional triggers. Sleep paralysis. This is a sensation of being unable to move despite being awake. There's also hypnagogic hallucinations, which are hallucinations when going to sleep or waking up. Another dysomnia is sleep apnea, which is characterized by the inability to properly breathe during sleep. Now, the other category of sleep disorders are parasomnias. These are abnormal movements or behaviors during sleep. They include night terrors and sleepwalking. Night terrors, they're usually common in children. They're periods of intense anxiety that occur during slow wave sleep. So children or even adults that experience this will thrash and scream during these terrors and will show signs of sympathetic overdrive with high heart, rate, uh, heart rates and rapid breathing. Then there's also sleepwalking, which is characterized by move, being able to do activities while you are being asleep. It usually occurs during slow wave sleep. Some sleepwalkers may eat, talk, have sexual intercourse, even drive or walk great distances while sleeping with absolutely no recollection of the event. Most return to their beds and wake up in the morning with no knowledge of their nighttime routine or activities. Also, fun fact, contrary to popular belief, awakening a sleepwalker is not going to harm that person. However, it's generally suggested to quietly guide the sleepwalker back to bed to avoid disrupting their slow wave sleep. Now, in the realm of talking about sleep disorders, it's important to note that sleep deprivation can result from as little as one night without sleep or from multiple nights with poor quality, short duration sleep. And sleep de deprivation can result in irritability, mood disturbances, decreased performance, and even slowed reaction time. Extreme deprivation can even cause psychosis. So if you're having problems sleeping, please make sure to see a sleep specialist. Two more things that I want to talk about before we move on to our fourth objective is hypnosis and meditation. Hypnosis can be defined as a state in which a person appears to be in control of their normal functions, but they're in a highly suggestible state. And so in other words, a hypnotized person easily succumbs to the suggestion of others. Something about hypnosis is that it's shown to work. Brain imaging has indicated that hypnotic states are indeed real. However, effective hypnosis requires a willing personality and also kind of a lack of skepticism on the part of the patient. 
Then there's meditation. Defining meditation can be tricky because it's highly dependent on the practitioner of the meditation and their personal beliefs. Because meditation is a central part and a central practice in many religions from Buddhism to Hinduism to Judaism and others. Meditation usually involves quieting of the mind for some purpose, whether it's spiritual, religious, or related to stress reduction. To end, to that end, meditation causes physiological changes such as decreased heart rate and blood pressure. So with that, we've covered everything that we need in objective four. We talked about alertness. We talked about sleep cycle and the sleep different stages of sleep. We also talked about theories for dreaming and sleep disorders. We've defined hypnosis and meditation. Now we can comfortably move into the fourth objective, which is titled Consciousness Altering Drugs. Consciousness altering drugs are generally described in four different groups. We have depressants, stimulants, opiates, and hallucinogens. Biologically speaking, marijuana falls under multiple categories. It has depressant, stimulant, and hallucinogenic effects. So we're going to consider it after we discuss these four different groups. We're gonna go ahead and get started with depressants. Depressants reduce nervous system activity, resulting in a sense of relaxation and reduced anxiety. Of the depressants, alcohol is certainly the most common. So we'll start there. Alcohol has several different effects on the brain. It increases activity of the GABA receptor, this is a chloride channel that causes hyperpolarization of the membrane, and this causes generalized brain inhibition. It results in diminished arousal. Now, behavior may seem less inhibited when you consume alcohol because the centers of the brain that prevent inappropriate behavior are also depressed. Alcohol increases dopamine levels. That causes a sense of mild euphoria. At higher levels though, brain activity becomes even more disrupted. So logical reasoning, motor skills are all going to be severely affected and fatigue may result. Now, another depressant that we want to talk about or another category is barbiturates and benzodiazepines. So barbiturates were historically used as anxiety reducing and sleep medications. They have been more recently replaced by benzodiazepines, which are less prone to overdose. Something to consider is that both of these drugs increase GABA activity, so it causes a sense of relaxation. However, both of these drugs are highly addictive. And if taken with alcohol, overdoses can result in either a coma or even death. The next category we want to talk about are stimulants. Stimulants cause an increase in arousal in the nervous system. Each drug increases the frequency of action potentials, but it does so by different mechanisms. And there's three categories under stimulants that we want to cover, amphetamines, cocaine, and ecstasy. So first, amphetamines, they cause increased arousal by increasing the release of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin at the synapse, and then decreasing their reuptake. This increases arousal, and it causes a reduction in appetite, and a decreased need for sleep. Physiological effects are gonna include increased heart rate and blood pressure. Psychological effects are gonna include euphoria, hypervigilance, anxiety, delusion, and even paranoia. Prolonged use of high doses of amphetamines can result in stroke or brain damage. Then we have cocaine, which originates from a plant, and co cocaine can be purified from the leaves of this plant, or it can be created synthetically. Cocaine also decreases the reuptake of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, although by a different mechanism than amphetamines do. The effects of cocaine intoxication and withdrawal are very similar to amphetamines. Withdrawal is extremely difficult, leading to depression, fatigue, and irritability during the process. 
Cocaine also has anesthetic properties, and it's sometimes used in surgeries in highly vascularized areas such as the nose and throat. Now, crack is a form of cocaine that can be smoked. With quick and potent effects, this drug is highly addictive. Then we have ecstasy, which also falls under the category of stimulants. Ecstasy acts as a hallucinogen combined with an amphetamine. It is a designer amphetamine, and as a designer amphetamine, its mechanisms and effects are really similar to other amphetamines. So physiologically, ecstasy causes increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, blurry vision, sweating, nausea, and so on. Psychologically, ecstasy causes feelings of euphoria, increased alertness, and an overwhelming sense of well-being and connectedness. Hence why it's a really popular club or rave drug. The next category is opiates or opioids. They're derived from the poppy plant. So opium is derived from the poppy plant, I should say. It has been used and abused for centuries. Today, we have numerous drugs that are used both recreationally and therapeutically that's derived from opium. So naturally occurring forms called opiates include morphine and codeine. And semi-synthetic derivatives called opioids include uh, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and heroin. These compounds are going to bind to opioid receptors in the peripheral and central nervous system, and it's going to result in decreased reaction to pain and then a sense of euphoria. Now, heroin, interestingly enough, was originally created as a substitute for morphine. However, once injected, the body rapidly metabolizes heroin to morphine. The next category is hallucinogens. So these include drugs like LSD, ketamine, and shrooms. The exact mechanism of most hallucinogens is unknown, but it's thought to be a complex interaction between numerous neurotransmitters, especially serotonin. These drugs typically cause distortions of reality and fantasy. They enhance your sensory experiences and introspection. Physiological effects include increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, dilation of pupils, sweating, and increased body temperature. So those are the four categories of consciousness-altering drugs, depressants, stimulants, opiates, and hallucinogens. Marijuana, like we said earlier, falls under multiple categories. It has stimulant, depressant, and hallucinogenic effects. It primarily refers to the leaves and flowers of two plant species, cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. And the active chemical in marijuana is known as THC. THC exerts its effects by acting at cannabinoid receptors, glycine receptors, and opioid receptors. How these receptors interact to create the quote-unquote high that's achieved from marijuana is unknown. What is known, however, is that THC increases GABA activity and dopamine activity. Physiological effects are mixed, including eye redness, dry mouth, fatigue, impairment of short-term memory, increased heart rate, increased appetite, and lowered blood pressure. Psychologically, effects from marijuana seem to fall into the categories of stimulant, depressant, and hallucinogen. So with that being said, something that we want to then discuss after covering all of these categories of consciousness altering drugs is drug addiction. How does it work? Drug addiction is highly related to the mesolimbic reward pathway. This is one of the four dopaminergic, dopaminergic pathway, I'm so sorry about that, in the brain. This pathway includes the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, 
and the connections between them called the medial forebrain bundle. This pathway is normally involved in motivation and emotional response, and its activation accounts for the positive reinforcement of substance use. Now, this addiction pathway is activated by all substances that produce psychological dependence. This also means that gambling and falling in love also activate this pathway. That's very interesting, right? With that, we have completed objective four. So now we can move into objective five. Objective five is titled attention. Attention refers to concentrating on one aspect of the sensory environment. While this definition is straightforward, an understanding of how attention works and the mechanisms by which we can shift our attention from one set of stimuli to another is still somewhat unclear. But in this objective, our main focus is to compare and contrast selective attention with divided attention. Selective attention is focusing on one part of the sensory environment while ignoring other stimuli. And so it therefore acts as a filter between sensory stimuli and our processing systems. If a stimulus is attended to, it's passed through a filter and analyzed further. But if the stimulus is not attended to, it is lost. In contrast to selective attention, divided attention is the ability to perform multiple tasks at the same time. Now, most new or complex, complex tasks, they require undivided attention and they utilize controlled processing. In contrast, familiar or routine actions, they can be performed with automatic processing, which permits the brain to focus on other tasks with divided attention. A good example is let's consider learning to drive. At first, Drivers intensely grip the steering wheel. They pay attention to every detail of the road ahead. But then as you become more accustomed to driving, you can relegate some aspects of driving, like knowing how hard to push on the pedal, to automatic processing. And then this lets the driver perform secondary tasks like changing the radio station. So again, Selective attention is focusing on one part of the sensory environment while ignoring other stimuli, and divided attention is the ability to perform multiple tasks at the same time. With that, we can move into our last and final objective titled language. Whether it's written, spoken, or signed, language is fundamental to the creation of communities. And as humans begin to live in groups, the ability to communicate became essential. Now, there are five basic components of language, phonology, morphology, semantics, syntax, and pragmatics. And we're going to go over the definitions of each of these components. Now, phonology refers to the actual sound of language. Morphology refers to the structure of words. Semantics refers to the association of meaning with a word. Syntax refers to how words are put together to form sentences, and pragmatics refers to the dependence of language on context and pre-existing knowledge. Now, to effectively interact with society, a child has to learn to communicate through language, whether oral or signed. An important precursor to language is babbling. Almost without exception, children, including deaf children, spontaneously begin to babble during their first year. For hearing children, babbling reaches its highest frequency between 9 and 12 months. And for deaf children, verbal babbling ceases soon after it begins. For the most part, language is substantially mastered by the age of five, and the acquisition of language appears easy for most children, which has led to significant speculation on exactly how this works. And so what we're going to cover next is a couple of theories that are proposed to explain this. We start off first with the nativist or the biological theory. It's largely credited to linguist Noam Chomsky, who advocates for the existence of some innate capacity for language. And he notes that children learn to make such transformations in their language effortlessly at an early age, and therefore concludes that this ability to learn language grammar must be innate. Then there's the learning 
theory. This is proposed by B.F. Skinner, and he explained language ac acquisition by operant conditioning. So very young babies are capable of distinguishing between sounds for all human languages, but by six months of age, they show a strong preference for sounds in the language that's spoken by their parents. And Skinner explained that language acquisition happens by reinforcement. That is, parents and caregivers repeat and reinforce sounds that sound most like the language they speak. Then there's also the social interactionist theory of language development. It focuses on the interplay between biological and social processes. So that is language acquisition is driven by the child's desire to communicate and behave in a social manner, such as interacting with their parents, their caregivers, and other children. Now, the influence of language on cognition is also important to discuss, and psycholinguistics have long focused on this relationship between language and thinking. Linguist Benjamin Whorf proposed the Whorfian hypothesis, also called the linguistic relativity hypothesis, and it suggests that our perception of reality, the way we think about the world, is determined by the content of language. In essence, language affects the way we think rather than the other way around. And I think this is a good segue to also discussing, well, what are the brain areas that work for language development and for language comprehension. So there are two different areas of the brain that are responsible for speech production and language comprehension. Both are lo located in the dominant hemisphere, which is usually the left hemisphere. First, we have Bracca's area. It's located in the inferior frontal gyrus of the frontal lobe. It controls the motor function of speech through connections with the motor cortex. And then there's Wernick's area. It's located in the superior temporal gyrus of the temporal lobe, and it is responsible for language comprehension. Now, Bracca's area and Wernick's area are connected by a bundle of axons that allow appropriate association between language comprehension and speech production. Now, aphasia is a deficit of language production or comprehension. Much of what we know regarding language and aphasia is through observations of people with damage to speech-related areas. So when damage occurs to Bracca's area, Speech comprehension is still intact, but the patient will have a reduced or absent ability to produce spoken language. So this is known as Bracca's aphasia. These patients are often very frustrated because they're stuck with the sensation of having every word on the tip of their tongue. On the other hand, when Wernick's area is damaged, motor production and fluency of speech is retained, but comprehension of speech is lost. This is known as Wernick's aphasia. Because speech comprehension is lost, these patients speak nonsensical sounds and inappropriate word combinations that don't have any meaning. Patients with this often believe that they are speaking and that they are being understood perfectly well, even though the people around them have no comprehension of what is being said. This is very frustrating to the patient, as you can imagine. So with that, we have covered our last and final objective on language, and we have completed chapter four for this playlist. I really hope this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything, leave it down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.